as participants, one of the things I, I think, what, because you're here to learn and take things home, yeah, and we want to develop um, a strategy so that you do take it home, what we need to do also is to understand that um, we should need, we should um, develop a, as part of that strategy to get people with the knowledge to come to you if we, if you need people to assist in in sharing knowledge and you know giving directions or helping you to understand things, so that you get better bet, can better inform your own mob on on how to do things, because it may be that you know we're lacking and we do know in our communities we lack a lot of expertise and um, and our people need that reassurance and uh, my experience of the past has always been that I can stand up there as an expert um, that recognised by white fellas um, as you as an expert but then when you get amongst your own kind, our own mob, our own mob you can say something and tell them all about real, all the realities but then when a white fella come and say the same thing they'll sit down and say he know what he's talking about that fella, you know. And, but so our, our own mob find it very difficult to accept the knowledge of our own mob because we don't belong to that world. This is something, this is part of this um, psychosis, I suppose you can say, that's been um, pushed, thrust into our minds where our people are not confident with our own judgments and our own mob and, their, and, and so they need that reinforcement. And I think that's a clear representation of the fact that the dominant society's power and influence over our people, um, our people still need them to reassure them of those rights. And that's, that's, a, that's one of the biggest concerns we have in taking things forward in our own communities. And so we have to, uh, we have to make sure now that we go back home and we got a, we got a, um, Psychotherapist here amongst us who uh, understands it all. He, he not only is he an international lawyer, but he's also <laughs> as a as a very well educated uh, understanding of um, um, psychology. And I, I and the, Gary, this is something that we uh, this is one of the one of the small things in our communities that we. I think it's what it's one of the key key elements that, that sort of resist people's confidence in their own community to rise up against the system, uh, and that is that they don't that they have this attitude. A lot of our people, because they've been drummed in for years and years and years about the power of the white, of the British and the rulers. They want them to tell them they have a right to do the things that they want to do. My father told me before he died in 103 that people won't rise up even if they're starving to death in the streets. Right. Isn't that interesting? They have to have leadership or nothing will happen. Yeah. You were going to say something. I can see your head working. <laughs> <laughs> but but this, this is true. Our people will die before they ask for help, yeah, they, they, they because, uh, Gary, could you put that down as being something that's innate in human nature, that um, they suppress themselves because they feel ashamed? Well, shame is a natural emotion. Yeah. I'm supervising a PhD thesis by somebody in Malaysia at the moment on the relationship between shame and guilt. Right, yeah. And, and shame, it appears, is natural in people. Yes, it is, yeah. But leaders tend to make it worse. Okay. They tend to make people more ashamed by accentuating it. Yeah. But they are not ashamed about what they do. No, no. That's, they think that that's their duty yeah. to uh, you know, to tell them the right way to do things by mm. shaming them. And, and we're getting through the research at the moment in Malaysia by, um, by developing a method of narrative analysis to understand psychoanalytically what the shamers are doing and why they're doing it. Yeah. And we should have that in another year. It's a very interesting question. 
You know, I, I've been in a lot of meetings amongst my own mob out there, and I've heard them talk outside and at the fire and over the ta dinner table, you know, in, inside the homes. And we get into a meeting and then I say, dear, go and say that now, what do you want to say? And the first thing they say, nah, shame. And they say they, they resist that, to take that stand or express their feelings about an issue because they don't know what will come back at them. And that's, that's the fear of being shamed in a group situation. You know, I went into a coffee shop in Harden, New South Wales, a couple of weeks ago when I was driving to Cootamundra. Mm. And I was talking to a Chinese guy. I was standing in line for the coffee. Yeah. And I was talking to a Chinese guy in Chinese. Yeah. So the woman behind the counter <coughs> ignored my order and went to the Anglo behind me. <laughs> Now you know right, now you've probably experienced that too. <coughs> Plenty of time. Yeah. It's just, and I said, oh, that's an interesting racist thing for you to do. Yeah. Is it because I was speaking in Chinese? And she said to me, now you're being smart, aren't you? Yeah. And I said, well, I have a PhD in law. So the answer to your question is yes. And I still think you're a racist. <laughs> <laughs> What's his say to that? She, she conferred with the woman well, with whom she'd been doing business with instead of me, and they both said, oh, no, no, it's not racism, definitely not, oh, no. It's uh, just yeah. business. Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right. No. <laughs> so you never do business with them ever again. Yeah, that's right, yeah. See, this is, this is you know, that, that's, that's pretty, um, pretty much illuminates what, what happens you know, with us. You know, we can walk into yeah. the cafe at the same thing, you know, and you can be standing there. No. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, going back to that, that um, your talk, um, I, I, I'm the only Indigenous worker in, um, in my organisation, and we, we um, work in Cape York. Anyway, um, we flew up to Weepa, and all my colleagues are, are white. Anyway, look. We've all book checked in together, and it's happened a few times. And anyway, all the tell all the white ones were all in the front of the plane, and there was two seats. There was four seats at the back, and that's where us four black ones sat at, at the back of the. In the back. Right at the back. Aren't they something? Yeah. I'm just. You, you know, I've know. seen it happen with him too. Do you know who he is? He's a, from Romania. He has an undergraduate degree in metallurgical engineering. He has a UTS research degree in management and just finished his PhD in social entrepreneurship. And his English isn't perfect, and they, for the life of them, can't see who he is. He's completely invisible to them. I know the feeling. <laughs> I know it. Yeah. And, and compared to them, and I'm sorry, they're yeah. idiots. Compared to them, he's a giant. Well, yeah. And they, they're completely blind. It's just nothing there. Yeah. I can't really say exactly like that. Well, yes, I do feel like that. <laughs> but, but um, well, you have to have a little bit broader view of this, uh, or at least myself, I can see it in a little bit broader way. Competition for jobs and competition for survival in Australia, it is really very uh, hard. And in these condition, everybody, and especially the Anglo-Saxons, they protect their positions. Yeah. And no matter who you are, if you are not an Anglo-Saxon, you automatically, they build the fence between you and them. Yeah, right. And to get in, you have to be a bloody lucky guy. You <laughs> have to know somebody there. Yeah. And otherwise, you can't get through. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. get through yeah. at all. That, that's right. And, and, that, and that's, this is why um, in Australia they have this um, program. Like, one of the programs of, you know, the so called. Um, prioritizing um, positions now for Aboriginal people, yeah? 
um, so that they it, it becomes somewhat an, an, an aggressive approach um, to, to private enterprise and to, pub, and to the public sector uh, to engage Aboriginal people because they need to have them seen to be accepted in that society. But they have to make special measure actions from the Commonwealth Government to make this as a policy um, in the public sector workforce. Mm. And, and that's the only way Aboriginal people can ever get into those positions. When I, I was a lecturer, um, and I'm just dragging this conversation on because I'm expecting some more people there to come in the door. Um, the, the, um, the, when, when I was lecturing at Armadale University, um, they, the university um, are using Aboriginal people as cash cows now. Yeah. Um, they, they bring in Aboriginal people and they offer them positions in universities. Yeah. And they do these Aboriginal studies courses. Yeah. And they're Aboriginal uh, specific. And part of the problem with an Aboriginal specific study course at a university is that it's useless in the private and public sector workforce outside because all you're doing is learning about Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture. You shouldn't have to go to bloody university as an Aboriginal person to get a degree in Aboriginal studies, for God's sake. You know, it just makes no sense. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, um, and, and, and they asked me to uh, teach in one of these um, Aboriginal programs in Armadale when, they, when I got engaged at the University of New England as a senior lecturer. And, um, and then they asked me to, you know, lecture to the, what they call the um, uh, associate diploma people who, and this was a three-year program, by the way, three-year program, and it was an entry um, uh, method. It was a method of creating an entry for them to go into degree courses in the university. And this was a university-sponsored uh, program. And per person, it was the, the, to the university, it was $9,900 per person to do an associate diploma in Aboriginal studies. And they asked me to, and I, anyway, I was lecturing, and then I said, some, said a number of things, and out of, the, out of the nine, I failed six of them. And um, it, in, their, in their court paperwork, and then when I failed them, um, they went to the dean, and the dean came to me and said, you can't fail them. I said, yes, I can. <laughs> of course I can. I said, if I don't think they can do the job, well, then we need to, uh, I, I can fa fail them. Get some people. Um, so I, I, I just simply said then, um, why don't we fail people? And they said, because um, it's not a good look for the university. And, and the people went back, um, took the subject matters back and, and said, um, the dean said, can you review it again? I said, if you want to pass them, you do it under your signature, not under mine. Because what they were doing was setting Aboriginal people up to fail. Yeah? Because they got this university thing and they've given them approval and said, okay, yes, they can do this and do that, and that they go, they, they're able to um, succeed, my problem was that those people are going to go out there and say, look, I've got an associate diploma in Aboriginal studies, I go into an Aboriginal organisation or I apply for a position to, to do business, and, and the problem that we, got, that we have then is that they're not able to do the work. Okay? And so then the program that they're running then collapses, it falls down, and uh, then the government withdraws those services in those Aboriginal communities or they lose their job. And unfortunately, this is how a lot of things have collapsed. And so those universities, they're using Aboriginal people as a cash cow. It's just a money-making venture. It's, that's all it is. And, um, and in business, if you look at the business sector um, um, on the stock exchange, or you compare stock exchange and you compare the greatest earning organisations in this country in terms of uh, business, the, biggest, the second biggest earner of money in this country is education. Universities make more money than a lot of the big private businesses. They, their profits are enormously high. And so universities in Australia are a money-making uh, cash cow, and they're, it's a massive industry. And it's a, it's a rogue industry, I might add. Okay, we've got some people back now, so what we need to do... Yesterday I gave you some homework to do. 
I want you to keep those names with you, yeah, that you've come up with. And um, the reason I say keep them with you is because all I want to do now is just finish off on this discussion. And like this is a brilliant formula, even, you know, um, Einstein wouldn't be able to get, you know, the theory of relativity from this. But for us, we can, yeah. And this theory of revolution, uh, relativity here is about our, our lives. Now, so when we looked at this, um, what I didn't tell you yesterday was that when I came back from the United States in 73, towards the end of 1973, I was taken in, uh, put back into the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. And then the Charles Perkins and Barry Dexter, who now passed on, uh, the head of the department at the time, they then said to me, we're gonna make you um, um, a secretary an assistant secretary to the department, and we're going to um, create a new uh, division within the department for you to head. And that division is going to be called um, the Aboriginal Development, um, Community Development um, Division. And my job was basically to do, go out into the communities all over Australia. And my job was to say to the people, we're going to develop the community, and we're going to pour money into this community to make these developments happen. Whether they be housing companies, whether they be enterprise development, um, whether they be uh, medical services or whatever the case may be. So I'm in the office with Charles Perkins, Kumaje uh, Charlie. And then I'm, I'm also there with um, um, uh, Tika Dixon, Philip Paul, um, a bloke called Bob Morgan, who was the head of the Aboriginal um, uh, National Education Consultative Committee at the time. And of course, they said to me, well, this is good, congratulations, you, we, you're gonna become an assistant secretary to the department. And I thought, well, this is wonderful. And then Charlie said, but there is one condition. And the condition is that when you go around to all the towns throughout Australia and the Aboriginal communities throughout Australia, he said, what we're going to do is give you a list of Aboriginal people in those towns. And you're going to go to those Aboriginal people in those towns and you're going to you'll call a meeting, a community meeting, but you're going to work with those people to develop that organisation. So in other words, the government had already identified in every Aboriginal community in this country who they wanted to run that community. They'd already made that decision. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to go out and, in, and, and incorporate those people in those communities. Then they would pour all the money into those communities through those people. And of course my reaction was, uh, <laughs> not with me, that won't happen. I said, you, they said, well you tell us how you would do it. I said, I would go in and find out all the different community leaders within that within that one community. I said, well, let me take you, say, to my own town, my dad's people are. There's five communities in one town amongst 1,800 people at that time. I said, if you want to find out the difference between those that community and to see the five different families, put them all in one pub and make them drunk. Yeah? Then you'll see the difference. Then you'll see who's the proper leader in there. Because they'll kill each other. And, um, and then they, they said, <coughs> yeah, but we, want, we need to overcome that. We need to put an organisation under. So you put one organisation in there and you put one family to run that organisation or two families to run that organisation. The other fellow's going to say, up them, they won't use the service and they'll drive hundreds of miles away to use another town. There's another service, they will not use that one in town because they don't get on together. Okay? They don't. And so the reality, and I said to them, the reality is you do that you're causing, going to cause a disaster. Yeah? Now, that was 1970, that was uh, February of 1974. Now, the reason I asked you yesterday to write down a list of names of people who are controlling you in your community, and if you showed me who those people are, I'll bet you I can associate every <coughs> one of those families or people with what they told me to do in 1974 and that I bet you they're still running those organisations. Yeah? So, <clears throat> what we've got, and what we talked about yesterday, 
is how the government have manipulated a situation where they control us big time and we don't even know how they're controlling us. Yeah. Right out in our own communities, right under our own noses. We still don't know. And we still have the same fights where we don't like them more because they're running this organisation and they're running us down and they're the only ones getting the money all the time and the rest of the people miss out. Yeah? Now, so this is the barrier that we have in our own communities. This is why there's complete breakdown and dysfunction in our communities. And then when you trace those people back who've been running those organisations and keep getting the money coming through to them, no matter how much criminal activity and how much misappropriation or directing monies go somewhere else, <coughs> not one of those persons have ever been prosecuted for what they've done wrong. Yeah? So then when we start looking at all those people, you can trace them right back to these people here. You can, you can make the connections very easily. And so it's through this mechanism that they set up back in the 70s at government level, um, both with Labor as well as uh, the Liberal National Party Coalition government, they have, those two, those two political parties have one agenda, and that is never for us to be Aborigines anymore. Okay? John Howard started the process when he changed it from Aboriginal to Indigenous. Yeah, because when you look at the word indigenous, indigenous is a person who's born of the land. That means Pauline Hanson is indigenous to Australia if she's born in this country. Right? So the word indigenous is an assimilation um, tool to take away our independent identities. And so what we're doing now through this process of, of, um, of uh, pushing out uh, the boundaries of sovereignty, this is where um, we, this is the only way we're going to win if we, want to, if we really want to be who we are and maintain our own identity. Um, so for those of you who've got your list and names, um, I'd really like to have a look at them later on um, because um, I, I want to connect them to these people and to see if they are still running the show at a very senior high level. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run through something here for the next half hour with you, and then we have a Q&A. Uh, we'll have a cup of tea, and we're, while we're having a cup of tea, um, you can ask questions about it. Um, so I'm going to present this at, because it's a guide. Um, it's a guide that, that I've, I've and a tool that I'm using uh, to educate our people about the power that we have and how we can use that power and I think we, we, um, we need to take this action. Okay, Lisa. So, what is in this here presentation, uh, for our presentation is an introduction to the topic, the embassy and the black power movement, or it should be the other way, the black power movement and the, and the Aboriginal embassy, <coughs> Mabo and the case of um, emissions against interest, Admissions against interest, by the way, is, an in, is just a, a statement which talks about the fact that when people make, a, make an admission um, <clears throat> about something wrong, then that can be held against them. And it's not in their interest at all. And it's in the interest of the other party that's making assertions against them. Sovereign Union um, in UN and London, and a little bit more about the Sovereign Union, that's the organisation that we founded. Reparations and Governance. Um, so we'll... We'll get through that. So you look this is my mob. Now, my mob, um, a lot of the people said, you know, you, you've come up with too much, you know, detail in your flag. This is our flag. This is my nation's flag. And this nation's flag, this here is influenced by, you know, the creation, language, family, country, and ceremonies. Okay? That's, that's our business. And this, this, this gives our ceremonial passage, of, a rite of passage when we do ceremony. And we, so we just, there's a lot of other stuff um, that goes into the, into the, into the uh, ceremonies. This, is in, this design is influenced by the way in which we educate our people when we carve the trees, because we have these, what they call dendroglyphs in our country, 
and all our sacred stories are carved in those trees. <coughs> and so this is influenced by, by that pattern. And this just represents the story coming into our country. Look out, what happened there? They had us again. Look, they interrupted. Who doing that? I just turned them up. No, what is he doing? I don't know. Oh, okay. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway, this coming into our country, the knowledge comes into our country and it stays in that country. Knowledge belongs to us. And this is the people, it's a symbol pretty, pretty much widely uh, recognised by people all around around Australia as being people coming together to learn. Okay. That's my country, that's where my people are. We overlap the state of New South Wales, Queensland, as you can see here, and uh, this is the most famous area of our country, which is where all the black opal is found, and uh, made a lot of white people very, very rich. Okay. Okay, sovereignty. Now, Sovereignty is the, is the ultimate power, authority and jurisdiction over people and territory. So when you're exercising sovereignty, there is no one else other than you asserting your powers. And where does your powers come from? Your powers come from your own law and culture. Okay? That's you. No one can take that away from you. And I will show you something later on that the High Court said about that. And so when, when, when people say, what well, sovereignty, it's about you exercising your governance under your law and culture. And no one else has the right to interfere with your decision making. No one else can take that away from you. And that's where you assert your authority over your country within your land. No one is allowed to. So no other person, state, group, tribe or, or state can tell a sovereign entity, state, what to do with this land or its people. And that's what our people have got to really get in their heads. Is that when they assert this and when they do this, if they don't like you, tell them to piss off. That's what the Australian government do. They say, if you don't like our country, get out of here. If you don't like the way we do things, get out. We can do the same thing. As a sovereign entity, uh, we can, d can decide and administer it. uh, its own laws, can determine and use its land, and can do pretty much as it pleases, free of external influences. Right? And that comes from a, an, a lawyer um, who an international lawyer, Alessandro um, Palazzone, um, who's a teach, who teaches uh, constitutional law at the uh, University of Southern Cross in, uh, up at Tweed Heads, up in, sorry, Lismore. So this is the legitimacy of our claim. And until, when our people get to understand this power, that's when we put the fear of all those organisations and government. We can make them understand that we become assertive. Okay, next one. Now, conflict of law, who owns Australia, right? Now, when we put this up, we were young fellows, um, that's Billy Craigie, uh, Bertie Williams, and myself. And when this is the first embassy, it was that umbrella. Within, tw within uh, four hours of this going up, two people from the Quakers um, religious group uh, brought those two tents and said, here, better than sleeping under an umbrella, sleeping in his tents. And so we put, when we put that up, one thing that happened at that there, there was no law in this country that the police or the government could use to move us. No law. And that shocked them. And that's why the embassy is still there. Because there's no law in this country that can move us from that country. And so they can make a law, but the only two people who can give an order to move that embassy now is the Speaker of the House of Parliament or the President of the Senate. They're the only two people, not even the Governor of this country, can make an order to move that. If the government Governor makes an order to remove that, he has to use the military power of war to move it. That's the only way you can do it. And so <clears throat> that can be put down as a civil disobedience and under civil law, it can be the only two people who can order that that be moved is the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. So when we put this up, this word here, embassy, yeah, that is the one that sent shockwaves throughout Australia. But not only did that send shockwaves throughout Australia, that picture there of us three sitting there that morning, that's the very first morning when the sun came up, when that picture was shown around the world, 
on international media. The whole world, um, Australia became very embarrassed because there was a lot of communications between foreign countries saying, what the hell is this? What's going on? Yeah? And, and I, I could, you know, that, that's just another lesson in itself in terms of the power and influence of that Aboriginal embassy had, that beach umbrella had, and then three, three, there were four of us, this other fellow was frightened of policemen, he went home the next morning. But the, um, the power of that was so great. There was an international social, uh, there was a very well recognised um, social scientist by the name of C.D. Rowley, who was a lecturer in social science, and he wrote about Aboriginal people, the destruction of Aboriginal societies, and he studied the social phenomena of assimilation. And he wrote about this here uh, in the, one of his books, I think, uh, called The Destruction of Aboriginal Society. <clears throat> and what he said was that this here shocked the Australian government to their, you know, right to the, their very core and root of their existence. And he said, the word, the, the embassy was the first time Australia's sovereignty was ever challenged by Aboriginal people in a public in a public um, a confrontation like that. This is some of the demonstration. These are the happy days of when people really didn't care whether they had guns or whether they had bombs or whether they had anything. We just, we, as far as we were concerned, we were bulletproof, yeah, and you can do whatever you want. You weren't gonna bloody stop us at all. Yeah? We didn't care who came, what they sent out of us. We were ready for whatever they were <coughs> prepared to throw back at. That's me, when I was skinny, <laughs> good looking, yeah. <laughs> and that, by the way, was the very first flag that flew at the embassy. It was made by an Aboriginal man down the south coast at Nara. Um, and, um, and that flag came from Nara, and that was black, and uh, that was mustard colour, the two flags, and it represented, this one here is a, is a spear of trouble. That's the one that settles disputes for us in the eastern states. When you've got that spear, and many like that there, that's the one there now we use to settle the dispute, that one. And so that represented the dispute, and this here he told us this was the people sitting around all this trouble that we had to sort out. And that's what that flag represented. Okay. Here at that embassy, uh, about uh, six weeks later, um, it's, you know, it's a bit of a cloudy picture, but the man who's talking there is none other than Gough Whitlam. And Gough Whitlam was the uh, opposition leader at the time, <coughs> and, um, and what Gough Whitlam was telling us there at that time was that when I become Prime Minister, you will get land rights. But because they sacked him before his time, um, he, he didn't even get to finish the Northern Territory Land Rights Act. And he did that because he knew he could put it in place and give Northern Territory, you know, that Northern Territory Land Rights Act. And that, that's where the Bureau of Northern Land Council was set up from that. Um, but he didn't get to finish his job because he got sacked in 1975. Um, but then... <coughs> would he have changed the whole... Do you think if he got through, if he got in, <coughs> Would that have been a massive change for Australia? Well, <coughs> yeah, I'll... I'll I tell years to come. Yeah, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to show you something. There's going to be another picture of you later on of me. But one thing that happened was when he became Prime Minister, he did say to us, <coughs> he said to us at the embassy, he said, I can't do it overnight, but be patient with me and we will bring the changes and give back to your mob what you need. So he he set a path. He made a promise, and he and he was he, he was going to he would have lived up to that promise. I wonder where he came from, like as a white man. I wonder how he came. I know that all with I, that mentality. <laughs> well, at that I, time. yeah, I know that he he had a very good conscience about human rights. He was also very um, very disturbed about the way in which Aboriginal people were um, were impacted on by European colonisation. And the thing that hurt him most was the fact that he was a lawyer. He was an international lawyer um, as well. But one thing that he could not deal with in, in his own heart and conscience was the fact that 
In, the, in Queensland, under the Aboriginal, uh, Queensland still had the Aboriginal Act in place, the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands Act. And in that, Blackfellas were still locked up and imprisoned on the missions yeah, in Queensland. That was, they didn't get rid of that until 1975. <clears throat> and what, he, what, what used to disturb him was that they'd send in a white magistrate onto that mission to deal with crime and, and punishment and so on, law and order. And if a black fellow was put in jail, they'd take him off the mission, put him in a white jail. But if there was no right for that black fellow then to appeal that decision of that judge, that magistrate, to an outside court. So we were blocked from going into the mainstream um, legal system to appeal anything that happened on the missions in Queensland. And that's the one that really shocked him. And it was that, it was that, just that one matter that he needed to address as soon as he could to give people the right in law and justice. And what he did was that he brought in the Racial Discrimination Act, the RDA, that we have today in 1975. He brought that in because that was the only way in which he could protect Aboriginal people from racist legislation in this country. Right, and we're going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. All right, next one. Okay, this is the day, the last day of our confrontation. Thus, the police here, believe it or not, behind Parliament House, they had another 2,000 policemen. Some of them were, we found out later, and I know now, now know, a lot of them were uh, military, they were army, dressed up in police uniforms. Yeah. And they had them behind the Parliament House. And when you look at a thing called Ningla Anna, that uh, Land Rose Now movie, there's a movie that was made about this year, uh, that day. And you see all the police marching from, from behind Parliament House when they come to take down the embassy for the first time on the 20th of July, 1972. <coughs> but this is us here, we, we, we pulled together. And behind here, if you look behind here where Parliament House is, all private citizens of Canberra, there must have been about at least five to 10,000, it, it was just an enormous, there, you couldn't see any land or any trees or grass or shrubs. There was just so many people there. And the people of Canberra behind here came, they knew this big fight was gonna happen. We, we, and this was a fight, trust me. You know, there was 32, 36 policemen went to hospital, um, different things, broken leg, broken arm, broken jaw, broken collarbone. And one black fellow went to jail with crushed uh, testicles because the policeman kicked him in the middle in the groin. Yeah. But 36 of us, uh, 37 of us went to jail that day, um, white and black. Um, but we did more damage to them than they could realise. Yeah. What's the name of the movie? Hey? Ningla Anna. Sorry? Ningla Anna. We'll give you that name later. So. All right, next one. <coughs> And this is me, yeah. um, this is the last day when we decided that okay, we'll make a bloody mockery of this because we came back another day after that big fight, we came back the very next day. We were all let out of jail after four hours. We went back to the university at the ANU over here and we gathered the forces again and we came back the next day. But the next day we said okay, if they're so desperate, let them bloody take the thing and this time we, we do it in another way. So what we did was um, we let them come in, and when they came in, uh, they, they just took that tent and the flags because they could not deal. And now I know it was these two things here that they couldn't deal with. <coughs> they were the two things that hurt the most. And they were the flags, they were our symbols. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because Britain and the rest of the world, mm -hmm. when you asserting authority, You've got to have your. You've got to have what they. What do they call it? The um, the standard. They call it the standard. You've got to have the your flag. The law of heraldry. Yeah, the law of heraldry. Really upset them. It's a separate court. The law of heraldry. That's correct. Yeah, and so they couldn't deal with this here. They couldn't deal with us blackfellas having a flag. The Earl Marshal's court. Yeah, that's it's still it. running in Britain. It still runs in Britain. Criminal right? jurisdiction. Yeah, I've, I've been there and look at yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, that but as it would turn out, they were worried about those two things, not that little tent. Okay, next one. <coughs> um, now, that Gough Whitlam, he's saying he wanted to do things to see for Aboriginal people. 
Anyway, in 1972, I decided to go home and have Christmas with my family at Wee Wall. I had no job, so I went cotton chipping, didn't I? Because that's how I educated myself. I worked in those cotton fields as a kid. And I, when I was, we were cotton chipping, and my, one old woman came to me at the pub there one day, that pub behind in Blackwood, by the way, did, the Royal Hotel, and we were. And they said, this old woman saw me coming out of that pub there that day, and she said, son, you black power, eh? I said, oh, yeah, we're part of it, yeah. She said, why don't you fight and get, us pe get our people higher wages? And I said, oh, we could do that, I suppose. She said, I said, I have to think about that. She said, well, start thinking, because we want you to do it. I said, oh, all right, honey. So I thought about it. And I then, I, I then spread word around. There were um, um, eight different Aboriginal groups around along the river and in the town and on the edge of the town because we all lived out in our camps on the river and under tin shacks and tents and so on. And so I said to all the people, go to work, come back next Saturday, and we'll all meet in the pub. Anyway, that publican, poor fellow, he, he shit himself because he's seen hundreds of these black fellas going through his pub and we were going to have a meeting in the back in the, in the beer garden. <laughs> and so when he found out what I was doing, he came to me and he said, you Michael Anderson, I said, yeah. He said, please don't have political rallies in my pub. I said, oh, all right then. And so I said, I'll, I'll take it away. So what I did, I walked out of the pub and I stood in the middle of the street. That's what I did. <laughs> and when I got in the middle of the street, there were more than 300 blackfellas there. They were just everywhere. Blackfellas lined up, lying along the street. And uh, because I've got a big voice, I said, I, I was telling them, what I was telling them there was, if you want higher wages, don't work for these bastards. Stop working now. And then they all, they all, after I was talking, I was explaining that this is how the white fellas do it. And then all of a sudden they all, one, one fella, um, this fella here, that fella there, I'll, uh, he'll, you'll see him in the next picture. He said, we're not members of the trade union. And all I said was, if the trade unions, we don't need them. They did nothing for us now, we do it our way. And then they said, all right, you tell us what to do. So they all went back to work. I said, go back to work, earn some money, because next Friday, no more work. And then, believe it or not, there were about 600 white people working on the cotton fields, and those white people came to me and said, can we join this protest? And I said, not a problem. And the white people stopped work as well. Yeah? So, we go to the next one. How much were they being paid, Michael? More than you? They were being paid $1.25 an hour. We were being paid 85 cents an hour. Yeah. And um, so this is my uncle, he's married to my mother's sister, and that's his brother, and um, that's his sister, and, um, Bob, and this is Uncle Fred Inch. And this is the camp we were living on the riverbank, and there they are gathering at the back here. And the media came out and talked to him about it because they realised I was the black power fellow leading this thing. And they asked him and they said, you know, what do you reckon? And the old people just simply said, well, the only thing we worried about with black power is white fellas got power too, but they got the power of the gun. And their concern was white fellas and the farmers stand to lose a lot and if, you know, they could come and attack us and shoot us. Um, as it turned out, two days after this, my other auntie who lived uptown, um, my, my um, matriarchal auntie, uh, she came down and she said, you and your girlfriend don't stay down here because it's too dangerous for you to live down here in the tent. You come up to our place up town here. And the night I moved up there, um, that night, all these fellows were asleep, about three o'clock in the morning. Um, two four-wheel drives come past where I was sleeping and pump shotguns, boom, 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 into the tent where I would have been asleep had I been in the tent the next night after I, went, I left. They told me, get out of there because it's too dangerous for you. Um, so anyway, um, and then these fellas here, they panicked a little bit and they all came up there and, and then all of a sudden I had black fellas all sitting in motor cars <laughs> around the house, you know, during this time because all them young fellas committed themselves to sleeping in their motor cars just to keep anybody away from me. So it was, it was a pretty powerful time because, and what it was um, more than anything was an, it was a show of force that black fellas are going to do this. We really don't care. You can bring your guns, but we're going to do this. Yeah? 
we don't care. Anyway, within three and a half weeks, we were in the arbitration court in Sydney, and the wages went from 85 cents an hour to $5.25. Oh. So it was a marvellous exercise. Anyway, after this, Charlie Perkins turned up the day after the court. I'd been at a wheel drive home that night, and we were all celebrating down there, and um, Charlie Perkins came, and he said, Michael, he said, um, we got something for you in Sydney, uh, in Canberra. You've got to come to a meeting. When I came back, I went to Gough Whitlam's office next day, and Gough Whitlam said, well, if you want to do this here, he said, I can't have you walk in the streets of Australia while I'm Prime Minister. I thought, oh, shit, I'm in jail straight away. I thought they were going to lock me up and put me away while he was Prime Minister. But I didn't do it out the way. He said, I'm going to send you overseas so you can see what goes on overseas and how liberation really work. And I ended up in Washington, D.C., looking at the Black Power Movement in Washington, D.C., looking at Native Americans and their treaties and looking at, um, at what the government was doing in terms of the riots and um, the results of the race riots and everything in, in uh, America. So I could see how they were going to fix it up, how they were attempting to fix it up. So, so Gough Whitlam facilitated a process of me going out into the world and having a look at how people were freeing themselves from oppression. And I, I learned a hell of a lot. Next. This is the 40th anniversary. Um, so the, for some, um, you know, the rage is still inside of us. The fight is still there. 